Hello, everyone. My name is Jeremy Foster with USAID's Office of Energy Infrastructure, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Building Blocks to Support Cybersecurity in the Power Sector, brought to you by the USAID InRail Partnerships Resilient Energy Platform and in collaboration with the United States Energy Association. First, I'd like to start with a few webinar housekeeping issues. Go over a few features of the platform. You have two options for audio. Either use your computer or your telephone. If you use your computer, please select the microphone and speaker option in the GoToWebinar audio pane. If you use your telephone, please select the telephone option in the GoToWebinar audio pane, and then use the telephone number and audio pin in the right side of the display. If you have technical difficulties, please contact GoToWebinar's help desk by dialing the number on this slide. If you have any questions, please type them in the GoToWebinar question pane anytime during the webinar. We will share a recording of the presentation within a few days via email and on the USAID InRail Partnership Learning Channel playlist on the YouTube link provided here. There you can find other informative resources from the USAID InRail Partnership. USAID and InRail partner to deliver clean, reliable, and affordable power to the developing world. The USAID InRail Partnership addresses critical aspects for deploying advanced energy systems in developing countries through policy, planning, and deployment support, as well as global technical platforms. The USAID InRail Partnership's global technical platforms provide free, state-of-the-art support on critical challenges to scaling up advanced energy systems. These platforms include the Renewable Energy Explorer, Greening the Grid, the International Jobs and Economic Development Impacts, iJedi, model, and the Resilient Energy Platform. The Resilient Energy Platform provides expertly curated resources, training materials, tools, and technical assistance to enhance power sector resilience. The platform enables decision makers to assess the power sector vulnerabilities, identify resilient solutions, and make informed decisions to enhance power sector resilience at all scales. More information can be found at the website here. And finally, I'd like to introduce today's presenters. I am Jeremy Foster, a Senior Energy Advisor with USAID. Jamila Amadeo is also a Senior Energy Advisor with USAID, and she will be sharing more details about the cybersecurity webinar series. Maurice Martin is a Senior Cybersecurity Research Leader from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and will lead our main presentation. And James Ellsworth is a research engineer from InRail and will moderate the Q&A session. With that said, I'll hand it over to Jamila. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to our second webinar in the series of digitalization and cybersecurity in the energy sector. I'm Jamila Modeo, Senior Energy Advisor and I'm in the same Global Energy Division of USAID as my colleague, Jeremy. Today's webinar builds on the previous webinar and introduces the building blocks of cybersecurity at the organizational level and what influences establish uh, those elements. For the next three weeks, at this time on Thursday, we invite you to join us for more detailed discussions on some of those building blocks with industry experts and utility representatives who will present those case studies. For those who could not join our first webinar last week, our presenters discussed the benefits of digitalization and in the electrical grid operations and benefits to both utilities and consumers. The main message was on focusing on digitalization without sufficient focus on cybersecurity can inadvertently result in increased vulnerabilities that utilities will need to mitigate that may outweigh the anticipated benefits. So if you were not able to attend the last webinar, you can watch its recording on the USAID website. I also want to remind you that this webinar is part of the Business Innovation Partnership Program implemented by US Energy Association, where select utilities will be invited to participate in a high-level workshop on innovation and change management and nominate employees to join a more formal one-year program with the emphasis on utility change management and innovation. We welcome your comments and questions. And with that, I will pass the microphone to our presenter, Maurice Martin. Thank you. 
Well, good day, everyone, and uh, thank you, Jamila, for the introduction. Uh, the, today's topic is going to be uh, building blocks to support cybersecurity in the power sector, and we'll dig into what that means and what uh, uh, how it can help uh, your organization, and uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, those who are just starting out in addressing uh, cybersecurity for the for the uh, energy sector. A little bit about me, I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, and I've been in the technology research uh, business for the electrical utility industry for about uh, 12 years. My work today focuses primarily on secure architectures for complex systems, but prior to that, um, both it, at NREL and at my previous job, I worked. Uh, my work focused on small and undersourced utilities and their cybersecurity challenges. If uh, and those would be uh, primarily here in the U.S., that would be primarily uh, distribution utilities that were uh, just starting out in addressing cybersecurity and looking for um, uh, the, the right place to start. And in 2016, I co-authored a report that was based on a number of interviews and questionnaires that were conducted with uh, small and under-resourced utilities, and enabled us to really uh, to uh, better understand the issues that uh, such organizations face and what they need in terms of, of um, uh, cybersecurity. Work. And a lot of uh, what I'm talking about uh, today will be a combination of that experience as well as drawing on some of the guidance, uh, standards, best practices that are uh, publicly available, and I'll be referencing those as well. So just um, Just to review something that was touched on in last week's webinar, uh, the impacts of cyber attack. Uh, these were uh, discussed in detail by the uh, uh, presenters last week, but I did wanna review them and just uh, add one point to what was made at that time. Uh, all businesses have to uh, uh, think about the impacts of cyber attack that are listed above, uh, deleted data, uh, ransomware, uh, uh, theft of sensitive data, uh, this is true of every business now. No one, no one gets away without having to think about these things. But in addition, utilities have to consider the cyber physical consequences uh, by uh, accessing um, cyber physical devices, that is devices that are controlled by computers. Uh, a hacker could introduce safety uh, concerns, could interrupt the delivery of electric uh, electricity and also uh, damage physical assets. If you know how to misoperate a uh, large uh, uh, generation or uh, uh, other uh, assets, you can uh, uh, do damage that is very costly to repair. And it's these cyber physical consequences that kind of raise concern about the electrical uh, utilities and the electrical grid above the normal business concerns and make it not just a business, uh, make cybersecurity not just a business consideration, but uh, an issue of uh, national interest. So when we talk about cybersecurity for the electrical grid, it's the utilities, but it's also government agencies, it's nonprofits, it's uh, law enforcement. Um, it has to be a, a widespread effort in order to be successful. So throughout my presentation, you'll hear me talk about uh, not just from the utility respect, this perspective, but also uh, government, uh, governmental uh, uh, considerations and uh, particularly around uh, establishing regulatory frameworks for cybersecurity. So uh, uh, in setting out uh, to define the building blocks for cybersecurity, um, had some goals in mind um, as I said, we wanted to address uh, the issues that would be most of interest to utilities that were just um, that were in the early stages of addressing cybersecurity, just kind of uh, uh, beginning to understand it and uh, uh, wrap their their head around the issues. Um, we want to span multiple, multiple stakeholders. As I said, it has to be a, a concerted effort on the part of the utilities, plus the government agencies, plus uh, lawmakers, and the in uh, those nations and um, uh, nonprofits and international organizations as well. Um, the building blocks, uh, we know uh, 
from uh, doing other building blocks uh, the, the, that um, it's they have to be interconnected and interrelate to each other and it helps to define those touch points. And uh, what we're presenting here today is not the last word on this subject. Uh, in addition to uh, different perspectives and different uh, individuals or organizations may think uh, uh, some building blocks are, are more important than others. Um, uh, this is something that's a work in progress and we're and one of the goals for today is really to get your feedback and your thoughts on have we hit the right uh, building blocks are these the right elements and uh, uh, are we addressing this in a way that is going to be most helpful so here are the building blocks as we define them now um, and just to kind of explain the color coding that we're using here uh, the Solid green blocks are those uh, functional elements that appear within the utility primarily. And then the, uh, uh, the graded green uh, blocks off to the side, uh, threat landscape and laws and regulations, those would be external to the utility. But both of those actually encompass uh, uh, multiple entities. So it's a, a little misleading in that way. Also, uh, a lot of the, the um, things that we're focusing on for utilities would also be applicable to uh, government agencies. And we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit, uh, but this is the overall uh, structure. And uh, we'll begin the discussion with governance. Uh, governance is the, for cybersecurity, it are those functions that happen at the uh, high level decision-making part of the organization. And for a private company, that would be uh, the board of directors. The uh, uh, executive director or CEO, the, uh, the maybe the the C-suite uh, of executives in a large larger organization. But um, uh, this is where the decision making happens and where the organizational priorities are um, are uh, defined. And so uh, those functions take um, information about what is required from a regulatory point of view. What what, um, what you have to do is mandated by uh, uh, outside entities. And then uh, this makes decisions on resource allocation and uh, business uh, objectives and uh, risk requirements. Organizational and security policy. Uh, that captures the, the uh, thinking from the governments and turns it into a, a document or a series of documents that um, is kind of uh, set in stone that puts some um, uh, definition on just what the organization is going to do with regard to cybersecurity, uh, how it's going to do that, who is in, who is responsible for uh, executing the different uh, cybersecurity activities. Uh, as you can see, the organizational uh, security policy is kind of the centerpiece for all of the building blocks. Uh, it touches on uh, most all of them and. Uh, uh, shares information with uh, most of them. Uh, at the processes and actions that are required at this uh, uh, within this block are uh, to create the organizational policy, vet it with all stakeholders, and that uh, I would say would be something that, um, in addition to the governance level, you would want to review the organizational security policy and get feedback from the uh, from your uh, subject matter experts and technical staff. Uh, you want them to have a voice and um, uh, to participate in that. And something, uh, and, and I'm kind of speaking from the utility perspective, is something similar has to happen at the, uh, at the national level and within government agencies. There has to be some kind of uh, uh, series of documents that capture what hopes, what uh, the approach to cybersecurity and how that will, uh, how that will uh, uh, work in practice. And then the, finally, the organizational security policy has to be uh, vetted and uh, reviewed periodically. Um, none of the uh, uh, none of the the elements of cybersecurity are static. If you think about uh, what is happening uh, in the world, the um, technology that is used by hackers uh, is constantly improving. Uh, the technology that we use in our organizations is always uh, improving and changing. So uh, cybersecurity is now and for the foreseeable future will be a moving target, something that has to be periodically uh, uh, reviewed and considered. 
Laws and regulations. Uh, this is a uh, building block that is out exter external to the utility. And if you think about how uh, uh, security objectives on a national level are defined, uh, the lawmaking or governing, governing body of the nation will uh, pass laws that are very high level strategic uh, expressions of the national uh, priorities and interests. And then uh, generally that is passed to a regulatory agency to uh, that will uh, put some meat on the, on the bones of those uh, ideas and serve as an interface to the uh, utility. So uh, at the law, uh, laws and regulations levels, uh, laws are passed, um, regulatory objectives are defined. Um, the indicators for those uh, regulatory objectives also need to be defined. And that is a fancy way of saying, uh, what are you, how are you going to check that the utility uh, is complying with the regulation? What are you gonna measure or observe or document uh, and review uh, in order to, uh, to uh, ensure compliance? Uh, and that can be everything from technical controls to documentation on processes, um, the uh, regulatory agency is also likely to perform some kind of either inspections or audits or reviews, uh, some, some direct meeting or interaction with the utility that will serve as a, uh, uh, as a touch point to both to uh, review the state of security and also to get feedback on the regulatory program. And then uh, like every other aspect of cybersecurity it has to be uh, periodically update, updated. Uh, for those uh, uh, governments that are in the process of setting up a regulatory framework, I highly recommend this document. It, it was only released uh, uh, about a month ago. Uh, it is released by USAID and really uh, digs into what we, what we want in a regulatory agency, what, what are the important elements and how do you make sure when you set up a regulatory system um, it, that it is addressing uh, security in a way that is cost effective. In other words, if you think about regulation from the regulator's point of view, your job is to motivate the utility to uh, lower its risk and address the cybersecurity issues. Uh, how do you make sure that the directives that you are giving to the utility are the ones that are actually going to have that result? And how do you measure that result? Uh, what metrics do you use and what indicators do you use? Um, this document uh, does a great job of, of capturing that and um, uh, is uh, really, really has some interesting perspectives on the real cost of regulation and how we need to think about that uh, in order to create uh, uh, effective regulatory structures. And before we leave the topic of regulation, I just want to share this quote, uh, which I heard when I was, uh, uh, I actually heard something similar from several different uh, utilities while I was working on the report that I mentioned earlier, the, the one that focused on uh, small and under resource utilities. And um, the utility uh, cybersecurity manager told me that without regulations, uh, he wouldn't have a cybersecurity budget. And this really um, impressed me because normally you think of a regulatory relationship as uh, maybe a little bit adversarial. Uh, and yet uh, that's really, really uh, the wrong direction to take things. A, a really good regulatory environment is going to be one that um, that is beneficial both to the utility and, the, and to the regulators. The regulators have, uh, because they are represent the, the nation, they have the ability to draw on resources to really define um, uh, cybersecurity threats uh, and, and uh, objectives at a higher level, and then they and, uh, give some guidance and support to the utilities. Uh, everyone focuses on regulatory fines when you when you step out of line, but that's just one small piece of the puzzle. And in fact, what I heard from the utilities is that they appreciated uh, um, the regulations and the uh, relationship they had with their uh, uh, regulators.
regulators. That's not to say that they don't rumble about all of the uh, paperwork that needs to be done when you have a cybersecurity audit. Uh, here in the United States, the regulatory framework is called the uh, NERC SIP standards, and um, there's a lot of work uh, when you have a NERC SIP audit coming up, and yet still there's, um, uh, it, it's not a, a primarily an adversarial relationship. And I would uh, encourage the same uh, kind of thinking uh, uh, in other, uh, in other uh, situations. The part of the utility that uh, takes the regulations and uh, begins the process of implementation is, we call that compliance. Um, and their job is to uh, interpret the regulations in the context of their business to communicate at a high level the regulatory requirements to the governance level, and also to feed in the compliance requirements to the organizational uh, security policy. So um, depending on how the regulations are structured, uh, this process may also include uh, selecting a, a security framework and selecting a risk methodology, although in some cases the regulations may define that, in which case it's just a matter of uh, uh, implementing. So it's there, you're going to see a lot of variation uh, in this uh, building block depending on the um, how the regulations are structured. But uh, as I said, documentation is always going to be a, a big piece of that. That's the um, that's the piece where you are able to show the regulate regulating entity uh, that you are in compliance and produce some kind of metrics or documentation or or uh, uh, other information that. Uh, that gives that assurance. And I'll just pause here uh, to discuss uh, an idea that um, uh, a lot of the utilities that I have talked to have kind of uh, wrestled with, and that is compliance versus security. So you think about compliance as uh, being compelled to take certain actions. The goal of compliance is to reduce uh, some of the risk that your organization faces. but um, there is always going to be a residual risk, and you are still on the hook for any um, uh, damages that might recur, even if you are already in compliance. In other words, you have to comply with the regulations, uh, but you also have to think of your overall risk and uh, and address what you see are as the uh, biggest uh, uh, threats to con continued operation of your organization. So uh, we'll dig into risk management in a minute, but I uh, just wanted to make that distinction. Compliance is not security. Uh, it should never be confused with security. And you want to make sure that uh, uh, you're going beyond compliance and thinking about what's really, uh, what's really critical for your organization. Risk management, uh, that's the process where you balance all of the different risks uh, and get a better understanding of what uh, the possible uh, consequences of a cyber attack are and what that would do to your organization. Um, this building block takes uh, risk objectives and business requirements from the governance level. Uh, it produces uh, uh, risk management um, uh, ideas for the organizational security policy and also uh, takes as input uh, information about the threat landscape, which we'll address in just a minute. But um, uh, the risk management is a big field, uh, and there's no way I can summarize that in this presentation. I know people who go to university and get degrees in risk management. It is um, uh, a very big topic, but uh, uh, one that will benefit your organization as you as you dig into it more and begin to frame your cybersecurity uh, uh, efforts around that. A big piece of risk management is the activity called the business impact analysis. Uh, this is the process of discovering uh, which of the uh, functions of your business are the most critical. Um, and then identifying uh, kind of the dependencies between those, those different business functions and how vulnerable those are. And uh, this is, this is, again, a, a pretty big effort, but one that will uh, pay off not only for uh, cybersecurity, but for in thinking about other um, uh, disruptions. And, you know, we all have to deal with uh, natural disasters, um, uh, different, uh, different uh, 
you know, we're all we're all dealing with a, a global pandemic pandemic right now. How do these things uh, affect your business, and how do you um, make sure that you are protecting and supporting the critical business functions so that you can stay online even in the face of disruptions that uh, uh, kind that we're uh, seeing uh, here today? The threat landscape. Uh, this is external to the utility, although the utility is going to de depend on this quite a bit. Uh, this is all of the activities by government agencies, by nonprofits, by um, equipment vendors, by makers of anti-malware software to identify threats uh, that might be applicable uh, to a business and to um, capture and uh, make that information available. Uh, so think about who, uh, and, and you can kind of break that into um, uh, the threat actors, those who might be interested in uh, causing trouble for your system, uh, and those might be foreign governments, it might be internal dissidents, it might be criminal in enterprises who wish to hold your business uh, hostage through cyber attack. Um, anyone who who has a stake in, this, in uh, uh, our motivation to uh, execute a cyber campaign against your organization. Uh, and then the tools that they might have available to them. And as I said, the, the tools for, um, for cyber attack are always uh, uh, advancing, they're always expanding um, and keeping up with the latest developments. And then the kind of the third leg is uh, vulnerabilities. So um, these are, uh, if you buy a certain kind of router by a certain manufacturer today, and then uh, uh, later you discover that it is, or someone discovers that there's a vulnerability in that routers, software, or in, maybe in the hardware as well, uh, that leaves it uh, vulnerable to cyber attack. Uh, how do you find out information? How do you find that information? And that's uh, uh, a form of cyber threat intelligence. Um, and you want to develop the uh, sources of information for cyber threat intelligence that are most useful to your organization. And there are, are a lot of uh, sources for cyber threat intelligence. They come from uh, government agencies, uh, law enforcement. Um, they come from vendors of equipment. They come from uh, nonprofits. Uh, and this is a place where uh, the government of a nation can help the utilities in that nation kind of down select from this vast uh, um, number of CTI sources and down select and get a, uh, an understanding of what uh, sources uh, uh, are trustworthy, uh, what are uh, most useful to the organization and which might address the, um, the potential hostile elements that are relevant to, uh, to a particular uh, nation. Uh, the uh, sources for threat, uh, cyber threat intelligence come in many different um, uh, flavors. There's free versus paid subscription. Uh, there's non, uh, they might come from a nonprofit organization or a government agency or a private uh, company. And then uh, some are specific to the electrical sector. Some are uh, more general, but still focused uh, um, on the uh, uh, industrial control systems and some are just general uh, threat information. Uh, the ones that are listed here are not meant to be endorsements, but rather just to show the, the range of different types of uh, cyber threat information. Uh, the Spam House Project is a uh, international nonprofit based in Switzerland that provides general CTI uh, and it is a pre, uh, free public service. And the one underneath is uh, through SANS, which is primarily a company devoted to uh, cybersecurity training, uh, but they do some other activities as well. And one of them is a, a free publicly available uh, CTI uh, center. And then below that, another. Uh, the government agencies and, and RSA, uh, which is another well-known company. And then there's um, uh, the National Council of ISACs. It's kind of an umbrella organization for uh, uh, other organizations, information sharing and analysis centers, ISACs, who uh, are industry specific um, and uh, uh, provide uh, uh, cyber threat inf intelligence for those industries. They, um, they, the individual members of the uh, National Council of ISACs vary a lot. Some are uh, uh, have paid memberships, some are free. Um, uh, you, 
need to do a little research to, to see uh, which ones are, um, uh, which ones have which uh, membership uh, uh, structure. But one thing to note about here is that um, for a utility, it certainly helps to have uh, industry specific uh, uh, threat intelligence, something specific to electric industry, but you've also got all the um, security concerns of any other business. So some general CPI is also good. It, probably you'll wanna uh, uh, look at a mix of different uh, CPI sources. And again, this is a role that government can play in helping to vet these and uh, to uh, aid the utilities in a country to down select and, and focus their uh, efforts. Once you've identified a source of cyber threat intelligence, someone in your organization has to monitor those sources and um, uh, be prepared to take action when an alert is issued that is relative, relevant to your organization. If you're just getting the information and not acting on it, then you're not getting the benefit of the cyber threat intelligence. So that has to be uh, uh, part of someone's uh, responsibility. Uh, stepping back into uh, the utility uh, space, technical controls, these are the actual uh, um, the uh, technology that is used to actually uh, uh, do the cyber defense. And that's everything from firewalls to access control lists, the intrusion detection system. Um, the uh, objectives for the technical controls are defined in the organizational security policy and communicated to the technical staff. And then they uh, uh, presumably are given some budget and then uh, begin the process of deciding on a security architecture, uh, selecting categories of controls to apply to the system, and then uh, selecting the vendors who are gonna provide that. A big area and one that is grow is growing in concern for uh, a lot of people is that of procurement. And uh, that basically poses the question, how do I know that the things that I'm adding to my uh, network, uh, the firewalls, the control boxes, the uh, uh, smart meters, how do I know that those are not arriving at my organization already uh, with some cyber compromise embedded or some uh, vulnerability? Well, what actions can I take to make sure that uh, these devices are secure? And I will tell you that this is a big issue. And I think worldwide, we're just uh, beginning to address this uh, kind of, um, it was kind of an assumption for a long time that uh, uh, systems and devices came to you uh, ready to use and free of vulnerabilities. Uh, that's really been challenged. Here in the United States, we recently had an executive order uh, that basically uh, is meant to tighten up our uh, our procurement and supply chain process. Um, that's a very new order and it's still being kind of uh, interpreted here, but I think you're gonna see a lot more discussion about secure uh, procurement. Uh, in the, my resources section at the end of the, the presentation, there's a, a good resource for uh, procurement language. And then um, all of these technical controls uh, in this building block have to be installed, operated, and updated periodically. Incident response. Uh, this is uh, the actions that you take uh, following a, a cyber attack. And the most important point about this building block is that you must prepare in advance for a cyber attack. If you wait until after the cyber attack, uh, you are going to have a very long and expensive process in order to get your organization back to where it needs to be and recover. Um, and you're facing a lot more uh, dire consequences if you are unprepared. Um, the objectives, uh, as with the as with uh, technical controls, come from the organizational security policy. Uh, and the technical staff is tasked with developing uh, plans for both for restoration and communication and reporting. And when I say communication here, that's um, that's the human to human type of communication. That's uh, everything from phone trees within the organization uh, when it's time to respond to a, a security event to um, which law enforcement agencies do you uh, uh, contact or, and uh, uh, let know about the cyber attack both uh, internally and perhaps you would want to work with uh, international uh, law enforcement, depending on the, the nature of the attack. Um, 
how you uh, communicate to the press, who is in charge of communicating to the press, uh, uh, everything, uh, everything that happens after a, uh, a security event has to be defined and uh, rehearsed. Um, uh, it's not enough just to, uh, to uh, capture all these uh, plans in detail. Uh, your staff has to be familiar with them and be ready to implement them. They have to know where the, the plans are physically stored and at least do a tabletop exercise in order to get uh, uh, have confidence in the process that they're gonna be uh, using. And their tabletop exercise is kind of the, um, the basic uh, way of rehearsing for these, this type of event, but there are other more uh, in-depth uh, types of rehearsals that can be done in order to uh, uh, get the organization prepared. Education. Um, save this for last, and yet in some ways it's uh, probably uh, the most important. And this is educating your your uh, 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 staff uh, on how to be supportive of the cybersecurity effort. And this is true internal to the utility and also internal to uh, the government, uh, governmental agencies, uh, nonprofits. Really, any any type of organization needs to go through this. Um, we have all heard of large uh, organizations that have uh, suffered uh, really impactful cyber events, a loss of, of uh, confidential information, loss of uh, credit card information, disruption in operations, because someone in the organization uh, opened an email, uh, clicked on a link, or opened a, uh, an attachment and let in malware that uh, basically brought the organization to this to its knees uh, it's happened so often it's we we don't we we don't even think about the sequence of events but it's still the most um that's still the most common way that these uh, uh attacks happen and educating your scat staff on uh, proper cyber hygiene and best practices for avoiding uh, uh, cyber compromise will do, go a long way to helping secure your organization. Um, everyone needs to be ex uh, uh, educated in cyber in uh, the, the best practices of cybersecurity and cyber hygiene. That includes the non-technical staff, everyone from your bookkeepers to your accountants to your, your uh, support staff and, and administrative uh, assistants. Uh, the executives of your organization will need, and decision makers uh, in, on the government side, will need to be educated uh, at a higher level about uh, the issues that they face so they can make informed decisions about how to address them. And then the technical staff is going to need uh, specialized training in order to uh, uh, up their skills. And uh, this is true of organizations of every size. I don't know of any utility that is not um, looking for ways to keep their uh, technical staff uh, up to date and uh, on top of uh, new developments in cybersecurity. Um, in terms of actually executing this, it's a, again, it's a big job. You have to prioritize the uh, the training objectives, identify sources of uh, training, and and uh, get that onto people's schedules. And we're all busy, and uh, uh, making time for cybersecurity training can be difficult, but uh, it is absolutely necessary and um, in terms of uh, resources for education there are some uh, very good organizations uh, that will come in and do training and even do phishing exercises where they send uh, emails uh, to um, to your uh, staff to try and trick them into uh, clicking on links that they shouldn't click on uh, that can go a long way in terms of keeping cybersecurity in people's minds uh, if your budget does not allow you to engage those kind of uh, consultants, uh, there are some uh, free online resources for, that teach uh, cybersecurity best practices and cyber hygiene, and, uh, and even some free templates for doing uh, uh, phishing exercises. So you can, you can hire someone to do that, or you can uh, uh, set something up on your own, but uh, education uh, is, is really uh, the beginning of, of a, a lot of improvements in cybersecurity. So those are the building blocks. Uh, as I said, uh, we are. This is a work in progress, 
and uh, the, would very much like the feedback that you can uh, uh, provide if you think we've hit the right ones or if you think uh, some need to be expanded or split into others. Everything's very, um, very uh, uh, in process right now. The idea is to take these building blocks um, uh, and build them out, uh, um, write uh, some, uh, some guidance around each one of those and uh, kind of add them as a, a new cyber pillar within the uh, resilient energy platform that uh, Jeremy uh, uh, discussed earlier in this presentation. Uh, and I'll be working on that in the coming months. Uh, please, um, please stay in touch. Uh, send me an email if you want to uh, review these uh, 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 building blocks or discuss them or make recommendations. I am open and eager to, to uh, talk, uh, talk with anyone who has a, an interest in this and wants to uh, see it um, um, uh, develop further. As I said, I spent many years working with uh, uh, small and under-resourced utilities, uh, helping them achieve better levels of cybersecurity uh, is one of my passions and uh, would very much uh, like other perspectives on, on how that can uh, be accomplished. So please reach out and uh, end with just a quick review of some of the um, uh, key knowledge resources uh, that were used in the development of the building blocks and which I'll be using as I write out the, the guidance uh, based on the, the building blocks. Um, those uh, are listed here. Each one kind of is an example of uh, addressing a different aspect of cybersecurity, cyber governance. Uh, that's that top block. Uh, uh, is a very good uh, uh, standard called uh, COBIT. Um, the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework was developed by the uh, uh, here in the U.S. by the National Institute of Standards of Technology and provides a good way for uh, framing uh, cybersecurity efforts. Um, the, uh, the second one from the bottom on this list is uh, cybersecurity and energy and distributed energy systems. That's actually going to be the basis for uh, presentation uh, in this webinar series on July 9th that will be done by myself and uh, one of my colleagues here at NREL. And it really speaks to something that we are focused on here at NREL, the um, security issues around some of the new technologies that are uh, becoming prevalent on the grid, uh, including um, solar, wind, uh, hydro, uh, battery storage. Uh, how do you make sure that as those are added to the grid, they are um, uh, secure and supporting uh, the security efforts of the organization. And I should point out that the building blocks that we're talking about today are actually going to be part of the, uh, uh, are going to be used to uh, frame a lot of the webinar series that is coming up. We're going to um, uh, see some of those building blocks kind of uh, expanded and discussed in detail by different presenters over the course of this webinar series. So um, if you're if you're feeling like you didn't get enough of any of these topics that I talked about today, uh, we're going to dig into those uh, in a deeper way uh, in follow-up uh, webinars. So please, uh, please join us for that. Uh, the top one on this list, guidance for energy regulators. Uh, that's the the uh, document that I pointed out earlier, and that has uh, so many good resources for um, uh, government agencies to uh, begin the discussion uh, about. Uh, how to set up a regulatory framework and how to work with utilities in that process and to give them a voice so that they are uh, more likely to um, uh, accept and uh, uh, participate in the, in the uh, uh, program and to have a positive attitude about security. Uh, the bottom one on this list, uh, the procurement language for energy delivery systems, a very useful document for um, uh, including language in your request for proposals. When you go out to buy new equipment and you issue a request for a proposal, um, what kind of questions do you want to ask the equipment vendor and what do you want uh, them to send back to you that will help you uh, factor in cybersecurity to your decision-making process? Um, uh, really excellent stuff there and, and highly recommended. And then the last set of resources is uh, kind of a, a recap of the um, example uh, CPI sources. 
uh, places that you can look for uh, cybersecurity uh, threat information. And I've added two down at the bottom that are just um, kind of articles from different websites uh, that give uh, the different writers opinions of the best sources for CPI. Uh, again, this is not meant to be an endorsement, uh, and I'm just list, just chose those two uh, lists of, of best sources as examples of because they both kind of um, uh, give a lot of uh, uh, instances about um, uh, the different sources and and uh, kind of show the range of things. So it's not meant to not meant to down select. It's <laughs> meant to uh, show show all the different options. Uh, down selecting is something that um, is going to be very specific to your uh, uh, to your geography and to your uh, uh, business needs. So that is uh, my presentation. Restart my camera and um, open it up for questions, which I think are going to be modified, mod, uh, moderated by James. Uh, James, you want to lead us in that discussion? Yes, thank you, Maurice, and great presentation. Yeah, this is James Ellsworth from the National Renewable Energy Lab and the Resilient Energy Platform. I will be moderating the Q&A question and answer session uh, for this webinar. Uh, if, reminder, if you do have questions, please enter them into the question pane on the uh, on the webinar panel. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I will try to get to as many of them as possible, but if we're not able to answer them all, we will try to get, the, uh, get back to you and answer them after the webinar. Uh, we do have some good ones coming in already. Uh, just to get this out of the way first, yes, this webinar will be re recorded and available afterwards, and the slides will also be available on the Resilient Energy platform. Uh, it's resilient-energy.org, and that link is in this presentation as well. Uh, so, kicking it off, let's go. Uh, let's go with this one. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of building blocks. Where do I start? <laughs> um, uh, that's one that that. Uh, I certainly heard a lot when I was uh, working on a daily basis with uh, the smaller utilities. And uh, I would say uh, two places. One is the gov governance. Um, and that's you want to get your uh, board of directors, your um, um, executives, uh, your um, decision makers on board and get them thinking about um, uh, uh, an entire cybersecurity program and what that means. Um, that takes a while to spin up. You have to make, uh, and I'm thinking of the times that I've worked with boards of directors, you have to uh, make a whole series of presentations, have a whole series of conversations to get them thinking about this. Um, uh, and then slowly as the importance sinks in, you need to um, uh, begin to talk budget and uh, what they can uh, uh, find the money for. Uh, so definitely governance, the other one I, say would be education because that is going to result in the uh, quickest reduction of some of your cyber vulnerabilities. If you can get people to uh, uh, adhere to best practices and uh, 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 practice cyber hygiene, I've, I've used that term several times, what that means is just like uh, cybersecurity basics, like, uh, you know, don't visit risky websites uh, uh, when you're uh, on your work computer, don't uh, use um, removable media from that you are uh, plugging into computers either at um, at different organizations or at your home, and then bring those back into your uh, work computer. Uh, so you can get people to adhere to cyber hygiene, and uh, you are already reducing a lot of the very uh, basic risks, and you're. You're at least moving your organization off of the starting block and uh, reducing the chance that they will uh, that you'll be subject to a uh, kind of a uh, kind of a scattershot cyber incident that isn't even directed at your organization. Uh, you sometimes hear about um, uh, viruses that are just released into the wild. They're not targeted at any organization, but a lot of organizations get taken down by them. Uh, you certainly don't want that to happen. So. Uh, uh, the answer to the question, I think, is governance. That will provide the long-term benefit in educational uh, and education, which will provide some real uh, short-term uh, improvements in cybersecurity. Great. Because we have a couple of follow-up questions on both governance and education uh, okay. that have come in the chat box. So we'll piggyback on that. 
uh, with this one. It says, uh, regulators are certainly not the first line of defense, but the leadership and vision they articulate in a strategy are essential first steps to safeguarding the energy sector from cybersecurity threats. I believe that regulators need to take utilities in the loop before forming organizational security policy. What are your comments on that? Uh, absolutely agree. Uh, the best, the best, um, the best results are going to come from uh, cooperation. When uh, you know the government uh, is going to have some kind of a regulatory program, uh, that program should be in discussion with utilities, and they should um, there should be uh, conversation on both sides. There should be listening on both sides. Uh, the utilities are going to have perspectives that the uh, the government folks have not thought of, and vice versa. Uh, and uh, the document that um, that uh, I, I put on the screen uh, really talks about the need to and specific ways to engage uh, with utilities and and how to have those conversations and how to set up that uh, that relationship. If you think about you know we. Everyone focuses on uh, fines. When you step out of line, you have to pay a fine uh, to the regulator. And kind of the assumption is like, oh, it's all about fines. It's really not about fines. It's about um, uh, keeping focused and, and uh, motivating uh, uh, towards better behavior. And that's something that can only really be achieved through uh, cooperation. So um, I'd, I'd say, you know, if your utility set up a meeting with your regulator, if your regulator set up a meeting with the utility, get everyone talking and, and discuss the best ways to uh, uh, to improve security. Right, uh, and this next question might speak to that. Um, what if the utility is not ready to invest um, to invest in advancing their cyber security system due to less customer revenue? revenue? Uh, how can a regulator motivate the utilities in such situations? I imagine with small utilities you've worked with, this might be something you've come across or yeah, uh, yeah. developing world utilities. Yeah. Right, right. Well, um, speak from a utility perspective first. I mean, um, and, and I'm going to use an example of very small uh, utility in the United States. Uh, did some interviews with them for the um, for the the uh, report that I I mentioned. Uh, this is a this is a utility that has a very small staff and serves a very um, low income uh, area, and uh, they didn't have a lot in terms of uh, security, but. Uh, at the same time, they had a recognition that uh, all of the personal information they had on their customers, all of the um, the uh, uh, information they had was vulnerable if they did not uh, take cybersecurity uh, action. So, um, you know, to a large degree, their their efforts were based on uh, individual initiative of the uh, of the staff. Um, and they were moving towards more of a you know organization-wide uh, address of cybersecurity. But uh, when you find yourself in that situation, it's like I know I know things need to be done. Uh, how do I do them? Uh, I would I would at that point go to the the regulator and say you know make the case that uh, the risk is there. Um, is there a mechanism for a, a grant to improve cybersecurity? Is there uh, a cost recovery mechanism that we haven't yet explored that would not uh, that would not unduly impact low income uh, uh, participants or, or customers? Um, you know, turn o turn over every stone and and uh, you know see if you can enlist the, uh, the the regulators and other government agencies. I mean, take it, take it all the way up uh, the, the chain of command that you can uh, and just make the case that we've got uh, citizens who are, um, whose uh, electricity delivery, de delivery systems are vulnerable, they, perhaps their personal information is vulnerable, and we've got uh, critical infrastructure, military organizations, um, um, you know, hospitals, uh, first responders who depend on electricity in order to do their job. And 
make the case that uh, we are now in a situation where uh, increasingly nation state actors uh, might appear as cyber threats. Uh, is it, is it uh, right for me, a utility, to have to defend myself against another, a, a nation state? Shouldn't that be the purview of the national government and can't we work together to, to make sure that happens? Um, and that's, <laughs> I will tell you, that's a conversation that's going on in a lot of places right now. It's like, uh, if, if we're being attacked by foreign entities, uh, whose responsibility is it to uh, defend, defend ourselves? So, you know, make, make the arguments, uh, shake the trees and, and see if you can uh, liberate some, some more resources. Great. Um, we just have a couple more minutes here, so I'll get to another, maybe one more question. Um, we do have a lot of other good questions coming in, and if we don't get to it, sorry, uh, but we will try to address your question uh, offline after the webinar. Um, so if you do have questions, feel free to keep asking them, although we probably won't be able to get to them live. Um, let's see, we'll go, go over to the uh, education building block with this question then. Uh, what's the best way to educate our staff regarding cyber hygiene? So, uh, what, what has been uh, discovered as being most effective is kind of the feedback loop. And what that looks like is um, you set a time, you get all of your uh, uh, staff to uh, see some kind of uh, educational material, either an in person presentation or a remote presentation or a pre-recorded webinar, if you present the, the, the uh, information to them and then you test them on that over time. And that can be done by phishing, sending them emails and trying to trick them into, uh, into uh, clicking. It can be uh, kind of spot check. Uh, there can be some uh, monitoring of the usage of work computers, uh, but, um, you and you and you set it up as a um, uh, escalating series of consequences if they fail to uh, practice cyber hygiene. In other words, the first, if they click on an email that they're not supposed to, or visit a website, they get a warning. The second time they do it, they get uh, a warning from someone higher up in the organization. Then you know, human resources starts to talk to them, but um, you know, maybe maybe they're you know, however you want to structure that, but. Uh, uh, gets the message across. If people know that they're that it's not something that they just look at once and then it and then they don't have to worry about it, they will continue to think about it. And it's going to take some time. Uh, you've got to you've got to um, let this sink in and then reinforce it over uh, uh, days, weeks, months. But uh, people will get the message and they will change their behavior. Great, uh, and thank you. Uh, for answering the questions. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, and a couple other questions coming in here. We'll, again, we'll try to get to those. Uh, we'll try to get to those after the webinar uh, and follow up offline with those. Um, one question that did come in uh, was, what is the difference between a threat, a vulnerability, and a risk? And I'd just like to point out um, that a great resource for answering that question uh, is the Resilient Energy Platform. Uh, which is resilient-energy.org. Uh, so you can head over there and that has a whole definitions of those terms and a framework uh, for, you know, for working through identifying those various threats, vulnerabilities, and risks. Absolutely. All right, with that, yeah. Okay, yeah, and with that, I'll turn it back over uh, to Jeremy for some concluding remarks. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Maurice and James. Really appreciate your facilitation and presentations today. Um, what we have here is a slide of the upcoming webinars that are scheduled for the cybersecurity series. Our next webinar titled Tracking Utility Digitization Process, Strategies, and Roadmap will be hosted by the United States Energy Association on July 2nd. We hope you can join. We'll send out the link to register for each of the upcoming webinars in a follow-up email. The next slide, please. Before we go, I'd like to invite all of you to stay in touch by following NREL on LinkedIn or Twitter. And please join the USAID NREL partnership mailing list. And the link is listed on this slide. Thank you. Uh, I think we have one more slide, just as the 
say farewell. Once again, I'd like to extend a thank you to our presenters and attendees for joining. We appreciate your time and hope you can take some valuable insights back to your organizations. A short survey will launch once we conclude, and we'd appreciate if you take a few minutes to provide us with some feedback about today's webinar. Thank you all very much, and have a wonderful day.